this YouTube series will cover material that we cover in our Introduction to Astronomy class from a meteorite found in Antarctica from the planet Mars and the search for life, all the way through to supernovas and black holes. So no matter what type of telescope you have, where do we put these things? We put them high in the mountains. Why? Well, because we want to get away from city lights. Not so remote that you can't get there, but you want to get away from something called light pollution. It's a strange use of that word, light pollution. You also want to get to the point where you're high enough in the air where the air is kind of thin. Have you ever been camping up in the mountains before? I guarantee you've gone out on a dark, moonless night and seen the stars and said, wow, I've never seen them so clear. You might have also noted that they don't twinkle very much as you get up to high altitude. That's because the air thins out. You knew that because you've been hard, hard, hard to breathe when you go for a hike up in the mountains. So that thin air is an advantage for astronomers. It causes the air to be much clearer. It's like looking through a lens that's not as thick as it used to be. So, Astronomers have a name for that as well. They describe that as the seeing of the atmosphere. You and I might talk about the twinkle caused by the atmosphere, but astronomers couldn't bring themselves to use that word. So they talk about the seeing. How's the seeing tonight? The seeing is how clear the sky is. That can be helped by going to altitude or by having a nice cold winter day where there's not a lot of heat rising off the surface. So we build our telescopes far away from city lights, and where the seeing is good. And quite honestly, we build mostly Cassegrain refractors. Why? Well, it turns out there's a problem with building big refractors. In fact, the last big refractor was built in the late 1800s. Because as the lenses got bigger and bigger, we started to have a problem. And that problem is, is that lenses don't bend all types of light at the same angle. What happens is, is that one color of light bends at one angle, and one color bends in another. So let's say we have red light here, and red light comes in and bends at a slightly different angle than black. Well, black's not really a color, but we have blue, right? As blue uh, bends at a slightly different angle. And before long, all the colors of the rainbow start to bend at slightly different angles. Now, you don't notice that much if you've got a small lens, but as the lens gets bigger and bigger, the different colors start to bend at slightly different angles, causing a disruption. In fact, astronomers call that an aberration. In fact, the fancy name they use for that is, they call it chromatic aberration. It's an aberration, a distortion caused by light itself, uh, caused uh, uh, by the colors, the different colors of light. So, big refractors suffer from chromatic aberration. The other type of aberration we find in big telescopes is that the, the lens or the mirror itself starts to get so big and ungainly that it can bend out of round. We call that spherical aberration. And that's present in both forms of telescopes, but again, the big, big reflectors have the advantage of being able to be supported from behind. So though both types of telescopes suffer from spherical aberration, only one type suffers from chromatic aberration. And that means that building big Reflecting telescopes, specifically the category and variety, is the rule of the road. Now these things can get huge. The biggest refractor ever built was about a meter across. The biggest refractor right now is around 10 or 12 meters. And there are plans to go 100 meters and past even 1,000 meters across. That's unbelievable. So you say to yourself, well, I got a 1 meter telescope and I got a 10 meter telescope. How much light is gathered by the 10 meter compared to the 1? Now, obviously, the 10 meter is a bigger telescope, but how much bigger? You might be inclined right off the cuff to say, well, this is 1 meter and this is 10 meters across, so there's 10 times more light. But you know, because I'm asking, there's got to be more to the story. In fact, you were right, you can fit 10 of these across if I drew it to scale, but the reality is that there's way more area to be covered here. In fact, area is the key word. Area goes in two dimensions. So this thing is 10 times bigger in one dimension and 10 times bigger in another. So how much more area does a big 10 meter telescope have compared to a one? 
not 10, but 10 times 10, or 10 squared, you can gather 100 times more light with a 10 meter telescope than you can with a 1 meter telescope. There is a tremendous advantage to building a bigger telescope. The biggest telescope, the Hubble Space Telescope, not the largest telescope in the world, but the Hubble Space Telescope is 2.5 meters across. Compare that to our 10 meter telescope. How much more light are we gathering at the, at the Keck Telescope in Hawaii? Well, you look at that and you say, wait a minute, 10 compared to 2.5, that's 4. It's 4 times bigger, but how much more light are we gathering? 4 squared or 16 times more light. That means that telescope can see things 16 times fainter than the Hubble Space Telescope. Of course, what makes the Hubble Space Telescope unique and pioneering is that it was above the atmosphere entirely. But with modern uh, science, with telescopes being built at higher and higher altitude, with different attachments being put on the telescope to be able to compensate for the blurring effects of the atmosphere of the scene, telescopes like the Hubble, though not obsolete, are not the, if you pardon the pun, light years ahead of the other telescopes that are being produced uh, at the current time. There's a real advantage to building bigger telescopes.